And ladies and gentlemen, reaching for his cup of joe. I got mine here. Okay, my big red cup. My famous uh, red cup. We have a cup with Debbie and I in a limousine on the way to the Comedy Awards. Oh, really? Did you win yeah. anything at the Comedy Awards? No, seven years I was nominated, seven years I lost. Seven years in a row you were nominated? Yeah. And I you lost to, lost to Bill Hicks, I lost to Carrot Top, I lost to, can't remember, Dom Herrera, maybe? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Hicks and Herrera. Seven years, got to go, though. Huh? Got to go, seven years. Yeah, yeah. And uh, on to L.A., put me up at the Four Seasons, that was fun. Yeah, well, I was not. What was the what was it? Co comedian of the year or something like that? Some it was George Slaughter put it together. The Comedy Awards. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, they don't do and them anymore. One year, Tommy Smothers followed Debbie and I back to our room because she had pot. And one year, Rodney Dangerfield came downstairs. He was obviously staying at the Four Seasons. Came downstairs to the bar. With two, in a bathrobe with two hookers on his arms. <laughs> oh boy! And I I don't know if he was you know physically able to actually perform at that point. Yeah. Or if he was just making a point. Do they know? do they hold those awards any longer? No. 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 Schlatter got tired of it, or he lost uh, he lost the uh, network affiliation, or something like that. Yeah, it was on ABC, and then they moved to Comedy Central for a couple of years, and then it just went away. It just went away. Oh, well, that's how much uh, how much it was worth winning. Yeah, it, you know, there are other comedy awards, aren't there? I don't think so. I don't know. Really? Hey, I'm involved in a project. Yeah. With a guy named Pat Johnson. Yeah, he's the photographer. Right. Yeah. And, and he's doing a book. Of all the comics that he, because you know he does rock and roll, he does comedy, he does sports, right? right. But uh, all the all the comics, because he did a lot in the early '80s and '90s, and you're in there, yeah, yeah, and wants to get uh, a couple of quotes from you, oh. and I have the uh, I have the the thing right here. Uh, the questions that uh, we're going to ask, because we're going to add. There's going to be a photo from the '80s, and then hopefully a photo, of uh, uh, current photo, or maybe not. Well, no. current photos of me scare little children, so <laughs> I, I I wouldn't suggest it. It would it would not be a family <laughs> book. Yeah, you're right. Uh, so the questions that they want to ask yeah. are: Do you remember? Uh, that time in San Francisco when you got that photo taken? Uh, no, because I was doing coke at the time. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, in the 80s, San Francisco was described as the left bank of comedy. Do you think it was different than any other scene? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was much more... I mean, I can't, I can't speak for other scenes because right. I wasn't there. Uh, I hear the only one similar to San Francisco was Boston. Uh, and uh, that was more a drunken bacchanal. Uh, you know, whereas San Francisco was like very, uh, what could I call it? Everybody cared about everybody else. Everybody gave advice to everybody else. Everybody was there for everybody else. It wasn't, it wasn't a competitive atmosphere as much as it was a collaborative atmosphere. Does that make sense? Yes. Very much, and and one of the things that uh, I maintain as well, yeah, uh, because there was no money, you yeah. know, yeah. in New York and L.A. there was, you, you were competing for money. There was no money in Boston or San Francisco. Yeah, well, that's why the communities built up. You know, the what trouble the, the trouble What's was is that yeah. that if you were in San Francisco, your uh, your your object was to eventually move to L.A. and have a career down there. Well, yeah. Okay, but that was the that was the, the, in the in when you were starting out, San Francisco was a great place to be because it was so collaborative and it was so nurturing. There's another term I would use for it. You know, I don't know how it is now, but it was then. So, oh, it always changes. You know, yeah. It's, oh, it's who the hell is to, who's calling you? I don't know. Eight six three number. Oh, okay. It's Monterey. <laughs> yeah. Uh. 
where were you in your career when when the picture was taken? Do you remember anything about the shoot? Okay, to begin with, I I vaguely remember the shoot. Vaguely. Um, but I would have to see the picture to make sure that I remembered it. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Next time I'll bring the picture. Yeah. Okay, that's all. Just three questions. That's it, huh? Okay. Well, that was, that was easy. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna try to get all the all the uh, comics who were there. A couple other radio guys, uh, Don Blue, uh -huh. and Terry McGovern, mm -hmm. and Doctor Don Rose. Yeah. Who, but they, who's they, not gonna be answering many questions? No, he's dead. Yeah. But the others didn't do that many comedians, though. Although, no. uh, you know, no. uh, I no. did. Don Blue didn't. Terry, Mc Mc Terry McGovern, I don't know, did Terry? He was a uh, comedian himself. He, he was more, yeah, he was more of a voice guy than a radio guy. Yeah. He would fill in, like Sarlat. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah you, I, were the, you were the guy... As I explained it, you were the guy who taught us radio because we had been on radio shows before, few and far between, but yeah. we had been on. And what would happen is you would go in and uh, the host or the talent was on the air and you would get met by a producer who would sit you down right. and ask you to give them three questions for the host to y ask. Yeah, oh, yeah, could, yeah, yeah. He couldn't figure out... <laughs> what to ask you so he would write the, write those down and they would disappear and then they would come back in 20 minutes and you would go on the air and you he would ask you the questions that were on the little piece of paper that you wrote yep. and he wouldn't listen to the answers <laughs> and then you were done in 5 or 10 minutes yeah he would be looking elsewhere at things yeah. while he, yeah. you were answering the question. Worst part it was come in at seven a.m. You started at six with with Joe or or Laurie or whoever was there, yeah. and did an hour, and then you had us come in at seven, mm -hmm. and then we co-hosted the show for three hours. Yeah. So we had to learn how to, you know, how to pace yourself. You also had yeah. to learn something else, not to do material. Right. You know right. that that doing material only wasted your act to begin with. But that it just sounds so canned and never, never felt, it f fell into the flow of the discussion. I always just tell comedians, just follow the discussion. Just throw in your, your witticisms, but don't. It's a don't, conversation, yeah. Don't think about here's a joke from my act, and now I'll just drop this in here. When I had comedians who did that, I never had them back. You know, because it, I because it, I it be, did happen occasionally. Oh, it happened a lot. Yeah. But I mean, it 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 I the reason I never had them back was it didn't do me any good. No, and it sounded you know? weird. Yeah, but somebody like you, you come in, you just you know you you well, cre create that, jokes for that moment. You know, speaking from the comics. Yeah, uh, I say that we were getting mixed messages, not from you. Yeah, but from radio guys, because there were radio guys who wanted you to do material. You know, who would get angry. If you tried to treat it as a conversation, because uh, yeah, afterwards, yeah. Hey, man, you're supposed to be funny. That's what I have you in here for. And so we had, you know, we had to be the servant of many masters. We had to, you know, adapt. And but, but think of all the guys that were on your show that went into radio. I mean, there are tons of guys. And think, that, and think of the, uh, think of how many of those failed at it. <laughs> They kept other stations, because I had comedians on, their idea was, well, we'll just hire a comedian. That's the worst idea they could have. And the reason it's the worst idea they could have, number one, comedians have about 45 minutes worth of material. And then they're through, okay? Right. Uh, right. They don't know how to ad lib for four hours. Okay, that's for starters. But secondly, you have a comedian bring in another comedian that comedian who's the host is going to feel competitive towards the comedian who's the guest. Right. I never yeah. felt competitive because I wasn't a comic. Who, worry about who gets the bigger laugh. I yeah. just cared that you guys got laughs, and I sat back and got the paycheck. You know? Yeah, the show looked good. 
Exactly. It, was, it wasn't the Bob Rubin show with uh, with Alex Bennett on. It was the Alex Bennett show with Bob Rubin. Well, who on. did they throw up against me? What's his name? Um, Bedore. Did they hire Bedore for something? No, 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 no. No, no they hired um, uh, uh, what, what, Marty. Uh, Marty. Uh, uh, oh. Huh? Cullen? Marty Cullen. Cullen. Yeah. To go opposite okay. me over at KNEW. Yeah. Failed miserably. Okay. Just failed miserably. Uh, when I left, they had Johnny Steele do my show. Yeah, he did all right until well, he got bumped from... Uh, well, he got bumped because he wasn't doing all right. You know. No, he got, he got bumped by uh, Howard. No, but he also got bumped because he wasn't, you know. They, they knew he was a place filler to begin with. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I heard that show. He didn't do radio very well. He didn't know how to do it. Well, Johnny doesn't have jokes. He's just a funny guy. Yeah. He, he, has, he has funny bones, yeah, as yeah, you say. Yeah. Well, so I, 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 thought, I, I, I could go I, back to I, that whole thing and tell you how, how Johnny got his job by stabbing me in the back. Ah. Ah, yeah. I, I know that. He, he used to go into the, after he was on my show, he would go into the general manager and kiss his ass for about a half hour and then cry and weep that I was treating him badly. Oh, geez. Yeah. Until he finally got the job. And I found out he was getting the job because it turned out the guy who was my agent was his agent. At which point we told my agent, you stop being his agent or, you know, we're taking you to court because yeah, this is yeah, illi that's totally, illegal yeah. who was the agent uh uh i can't I'm trying to remember his name now i can't remember it right now he was he was a radio the only radio agent in town uh, and he represented me and he got a decent amount of money because i was making a decent amount of money and when he saw i was going he started representing um uh johnny well that's normal. that's wrong you know you don't negotiate the exit of one person and negotiate the entrance of the other and uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, Johnny, Johnny. It's a, it's a way to keep yourself in the game. Yeah. So I have no fond feelings for Johnny, you know, because he was just a little wimpy asshole who went in every day and cried to the boss. Uh, oh, he's terrible to me. And give me the job. Give me the job. Give me the job. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. So when it was time to go, they went and got Johnny. And Johnny didn't do very well. The ratings tanked. They just tanked terribly. Uh, uh, well, Slayton did radio. Remember, Slayton did. Well, what it was, was comedy. Uh, it was called Comedy uh, World, I think. Was what yeah, it was yeah, called. on the internet. It was just internet. Wasn't the, it? Well, it was internet, but they, no, they're trying to sell to radio stations too. They brought me in on that thing, or tried to bring tried to bring me in on that thing. Was it he with Sue Murphy? Yeah, Sue. He was, did a show with Sue Murphy, and they were. It was out of this big. It was out of this big warehouse in L.A. That they had turned into a radio studio, and uh, uh, it, uh, you know, I mean, it was a big operation. They got a lot of money to put that thing together. It was supposed to be 24/7 comedy, okay, on radio. Uh, to begin with, uh, you can't do it on radio because if they want to get dirty, they can't. All right, so that's for starters. Okay, you can't do the blue material. So uh, they, the guy was running it brought me down there and said we'd like to talk to you about coming down here and being part of this and uh, you know uh, uh, they didn't want, I don't know if they wanted to give me a show or they wanted me to consult it or whatever but they wanted me to leave San Francisco come to LA and go in on this thing and uh, um, I was at in San Francisco at that time I was making somewhere upwards to four hundred thousand dollars a year Okay, and they asked me what I wanted, and I said five hundred thousand dollars a year, and they said, "Oh, we we don't have that kind of money." I went, "Well, you're paying Slayton a hundred thousand a year, you know." I knew that. I said, "You're paying paying all these other comics out, and you can't pay me five hundred thousand a year to consult and do a show when I'm the guy who knows how it's done." And they said, "No." I said, "Well, then take it and shove it. <laughs> you know, I'll stay in San Francisco." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I stayed in San Francisco and got uh, fired. So anyway, <laughs> no, they they didn't fire me. They had to pay off my contract. How many years did you have left? I had about fourteen months left. Ah. So they had to keep paying that fourteen months. Yeah. Everybody said, "What's it like to make that kind of money?" And you know, 
you know, not have to work for it. And I said, terrible, because you're literally, it's worth it to somebody to pay you three hundred and fifty, four hundred thousand dollars a year not to come in. <laughs> you know, stay away. We'll pay you this money. Just stay away. I said, it's insulting. You know. Well, when uh, Will, uh, Will, Will and Willie. Uh, me and uh, Mayor Brown, when we did our little show, we did it for 11 months. Yeah. Well, uh, we actually did it for like 13 months. The first two months were just a tryout. Mm -hmm. and, and we did it for 11 months. And it was supposed to be for 13 months. So we got paid for two months to go away. Yeah, yeah. So you know how, it, so you know how that one feels. But only for two months actually, at a, a much lower scale. A story I may never have told you is. Uh, the reason you got to do that show was because I didn't. I turned it down. Oh, really? Yes, I was brought in to uh, my friend Ed Cramp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, who uh, I had been fired uh, once, twice before. Wait, wait, how many times did he fired me at that point? Fired me. He fired me Cam twice, maybe. Camel? No, he wasn't a camel. No, he was at the. At the uh, he was at. Uh, he was at um, uh, Live 105. Yeah, I guess this would be the second time if he fired me from that. But he called me. I was, I was. Where was I? I, I just went in. I went in to see him. He wanted to see me, and I was in San Francisco. And I went in to see him, and he sat down, and he said, "So listen, we're thinking of doing a morning show here, like you used to do. Do you know anybody who would want the job?" He had to put it in that way because. I was working for Sirius, and that would have been ah. trying to steal somebody from somebody right. else, so you put it in those terms. Yeah. And I thought about it for a second, and I went, well, um, how much money? And they, they said, um, oh, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand a year. And I said, mm-hmm, that was more than I was making it serious. But I said, my immediate response was, I'll let you know when I hear of somebody. You know, so I didn't. I didn't take him up on it and say, "Hey, me, me, me." Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And and uh, so then the next thing they did was they hired you guys. You know, yeah. Which wasn't a bad idea. Paul Wells put that through. He put it through. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the problem is, they put us immediately out in the public, so it was a live studio audience. Yeah, maybe you weren't ready for that. At the Vitali. Uh, it was in the lobby of this hotel right on the Embarcadero. Yeah. And I think that we should have gotten our chops together in a studio first and then go. Well, you, you, to begin with, you don't want to do that kind of remote every day. Because you, in the studio, you have more control over the product than you yeah, do yeah. when you're out at a, at a location. Okay? Uh, I mean, we got it down pretty well when we did it, but we didn't do it every day. You know, you do it maybe once every month or something like that. Uh, you do the rest in the studio where you can control the output. So that's just my advice, but it's a little I, late. To I give totally it. agree. Yeah. And then a couple of times we had to go back into the studio, and it was a little, you know, it was noticeably tighter. Not, not like thirty percent tighter, but it was you know like ten percent tighter. Yeah, and that. A lot when you're talking about radio. I mean, I had a live studio audience, but I had them in the studios, in the but radio studio. For a while, studios. you only did it on Fridays. Well, no, no, no. I always, I always, oh, in the very beginning when I was at KMEL. Yeah. But when I went to the Quake, it was studio audience every day. Oh, but every they day. were in the studios. They weren't yeah. out like at the punchline. But there was only like that. 12 seats. Uh, we had 12 seats in the studio, and then we had yeah. people be able to stand outside the studio and watch it. Sometimes we had like 50 people there. Man, you know. people come up to me all the time saying, I snuck out of school and went down there, and people are always telling me that that, that was one of the highlights yeah. that, of, of their high school or, well, or college. And people, yeah. At, at the radio station, we could accommodate, I think comfortably about 50 people you know uh, five we, zero huh five zero five zero yeah because we had that we had the studio and then we could yeah. open this huge window that looked on to another room where we put chairs and so we could put the rest of the people there once we got the overflow our largest overflow was a thousand i think it, there was this one day when we had jackie chan on the same show with tori amos 
and there was a line out the door of the of the building that uh, we, we they said there were close to a thousand people out there trying to get in the other day i'm, I'm trying to get rid of books so yeah. i'm going through all my books yeah. you know and it's a pain in the ass uh oh i want to keep the, oh I want to keep, and i came to these stephen king paperbacks and they were all signed and i had like 11 of them and i rem and then i remembered he was on your show yeah. And I was on the show the same day. So I brought a, a Safeway uh, <laughs> brown paper bag full of paper bags and signed them all. Yeah, yeah. So are they worth anything? No. No, okay. No. Because he signed tons yeah. of them in his time. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, I, I, I found out that what you want is stuff that uh, n n you never expected is the stuff that's worth money. I had a, I got rid of my entire LP library when I left San Francisco, and I sold it off to this uh, buyer. And he would go through it and say, this is worth so much, this is worth so much. And then I had, like, you know, some Beatles albums that were kind of rare in that they were early editions, things like that. He said, nah, not worth anything. Everybody's got Beatle albums. But this album, by the 13th floor elevators, I can give you $300 for so it's always a thing, you, you think that, you know, it's going to be... Uh, well, if you had the Butcher Block cover. I had the but Butcher Block cover. But oh, here, really? Oh, here's the problem. What it was, it was yesterday, oh, it today, and, and tomorrow, I peeled it off. Uh, I steamed <laughs> it off, and I got to the Butcher Block on the back. Yeah, yeah. Well, then it's worth nothing. If you yeah. got it with the label, with the, with the cover they covered it with, yeah. worth a fortune. <laughs> so you know, that was one of my major collectible fuck ups. How about how about all the the shit that you used to get as swag? Did you keep all the books and and stuff? I kept a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I didn't throw it out. It's still in storage somewhere. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, best piece of swag you ever got? The best piece of swag I ever got? You? I don't know. I can't tell you. You know, I mean, there's just a lot of little pieces that I enjoyed having, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I... I uh, well, you were always getting electronics equipment. Did well, CNET have a deal with you? No. No. I mean, uh, but uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, the swag... Well, okay. The best... It isn't the best swag I ever had. It's the best swag situation I ever had. So I've got... At the Bunny I, Ranch. I, no, I'm at uh, the Quake, and, and I've got Joe Rogelski, and Rogelski is always doing jokes about truly fine ocean spray soap or something like that. Truly fine mist soap. I can't remember the name of it now. And he's constantly plugging, constantly plugging it. And finally, one day, uh, uh, it, it, a box shows up, and it's, it's a giant case of this soap. And I said, is that all you have to do in order to get stuff for free is just mention it? And Joe goes, I guess. So I said, you know, I really love those Apple computers. You know, they're really terrific computers. Okay. Next day, I get a call from my boss. There are three boxes here for you from Apple. I went, yeah. Yeah. Now, we already talked to our lawyers since you didn't go out and try and get them. And since you're not taking anything for them, uh, you can come and get them. So I immediately rush down. I grab these boxes. They're heavy. I put them in the back of my car. I take them home, right? They're all from, they're from Apple. They're the Apple boxes. On the outside, it says, like, you know, Mac, you know, the Mac. Whatever. Whatever. Yeah. I open up the boxes. They had sent it to me from Apple. It was three boxes filled with truly fine ocean mist soap. <laughs> so maybe that's the best swag I ever got, you know. Huh? That's hysterical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Son of a bitches. I thought I had myself a fucking computer. What was that, 90? Uh, I can't remember. I can't, I can't remember the time on that. Oh, uh, but boy, that was that was that was something. But anyway, then I can't. I can't. I can't remember real swag. 
that I ever got. You know, the T-shirts and caps yeah, yeah. and the keychains, and I I had a uh, I had a cube. Oh, I you know something? I I was uh, wearing that just the other day. I was wearing that very T-shirt just the other 93 day. Ninety-three punchline. Yeah, I should have worn mine today if I knew you were going to wear it. It's a really thick. It's a really yeah, good. Yeah, t-shirt. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but You're on the back. Am I? Is my name on the back of yeah. that one? Oh, okay. Uh, but anyway, so I uh, uh, so so I, I can't remember the swag. The, the one piece of swag I do remember is I had, um, um, and then we'll I guess I have to close with this. I had this. Uh, I was at a, a convention once, a tech convention, and I picked up one of these things. These little squeezy balls. Yeah. Only it was a cube. Okay, and I always like squeezing on it because you know they remember those. They're just great to squeeze yeah, yeah. on. And one day I'm looking at it, and this is after a whole bunch of stuff happened. I look at it, it says Enron on it. <laughs> so that became one of my favorites, you know, the <laughs> Enron the Squeezy Cube. Yeah. Debbie, Debbie and I at a gig one time uh, afterwards met this guy who worked in advertising, and he was trying to introduce uh, Panama Cerveza as the new alternative to Corona, because yeah. that's when Corona was big. Right. So we wrote a series of radio commercials for him, and probably six or eight. It was supposed to be like a series, like a detective series, a mm. detective in a tropical uh, climate, and they were pretty funny, And but they didn't pay us, but they gave us this beer. They yeah. gave us cases of Cerveza Panama. And we would come home, and there would be a case on our doorstep. They knew. So I guess whenever the distributor guy came in, they would drop a case off. We hated the beer. Hated it. <laughs> oh, my God. We couldn't give it away. Oh, it, it was perfumey. It had this aftertaste. Oh, my living God. And we kept getting cases because <laughs> we got on the permanent list. Even long after the commercial stopped running, and they would just, and we would show up at parties, and people would go, "Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah." Hey, listen, we've run out of time here, oh, buddy. And just uh, stories. And oh, we didn't we didn't uh, even talk about politics today, but why? I know. <laughs> <laughs> why? Know. You know, all you say is Durst. What a uh, not Durst. Uh, t- Trump. What a douche. What a it's douche. easier to say Durst, what a douche, because the D's follow. But I it, love the alliteration. The alliteration yeah, works. Yeah. Hey, listen, always good talking to you, my friend. Hey, Alex Bennett, you take great care, young man. I'm going to have Pat Johnson get in touch with you, and because uh, we're going to write this book, and uh, yeah, so we're going to get your, so you can see the picture. Cool. Ladies and gentlemen, the lovely, the attractive, Will Durst. <laughs>